Hi everyone, so welcome to the first review session that we're doing this term. Um, and this one will be fairly short since it's covering only one lecture. And these review sessions are here to give a little bit more chance for back and forth than the asynchronous lectures would. And what I try to do during these sessions is summarize key concepts and also give a couple of examples of questions that could show up on a quiz or on an exam. And I just chose this header image because number one, it's the dry valleys, which is where I did my research. Um, and number two, it actually shows a number of important map features that will come up on this week's lab. We have a lot of different lines on here, um, lines that serve different purposes. The, what, would, what are the brown lines known as? The lines that show these sort of, these rings around say Mount Erebus or in the right valley. What are those known as? Yes, indeed, Sammy, those are contour lines. And those are lines that show you elevation. We also have lines of latitude and longitude on here. So this map shows you both location in the world relative to the equator and the prime meridian, as well as the elevation of the features in the area on the map that's being covered. So this is also in today's lecture, which uh, by the way, I have um, not recorded just yet. I did want to mention briefly that I realized I had not deleted my previous quarter's files for lecture three. Um, and I thought I had gotten rid of all of those, but I apologize for that. So if you downloaded anything from the lecture three folder earlier today, you might want to disregard that. But I've uploaded the files for the slides. I just need to actually record the lecture still, which I'll be doing after office hours today. Um, but in the meantime, so here's a short summary of the lab this week, as well as a little bit about what I'm trying to get at by assigning the videos and readings. So for lab one, you're definitely going to want to review the material that the TAs have posted. Um, you also will want to review lecture 2A, which we'll be also going over today. And if you haven't already seen that, go ahead and watch that because um, you don't want to fall too far behind. Um, the TA sections start tomorrow on um, Tuesday, April 6th. And before I recommend looking at all of the lab material as early as you can, just so that you can figure out whether you have questions about the lab material and contact your TA sooner rather than later. And again, regarding the lab sections, it's not absolutely crucial that you go to the one that you're assigned on gold. The only reason I recommend starting with that is just to spread people out and not have the Thursday and Friday TAs be completely overwhelmed. But if say you do end up needing to attend a later, if you do end up needing to talk to a TA at a later time, that's fine. You can also go to more than one. That's one nice thing about doing it this way. Now, for the video clip I have linked on GauchoCast, I've included some questions you might want to think about while watching it, which might give you a sense of what I'm assigning this for, because I don't need you to remember every single, I don't, oh, that happened again, sorry. I don't need you to remember every single detail from it, obviously. Um, and I also want to mention, I am not assigning the whole video. This um, 25 minutes to 20 and 25 seconds to 46.45 is about what I want you to watch, and that's the part about Antarctica. And one thing to consider actually is if you notice, a lot more of this movie is about the Arctic than Antarctica. And for one thing, that's because the Arctic has much more of a human presence and a longer term human presence, including a lot of indigenous peoples that lived around there than does Antarctica, which has only been known to exist for a few centuries and has never had an indigenous population. But some questions to consider are what elements of Antarctica does it highlight? Like, does it, it talks about how, does it talk about how cold and dry it is? Does it focus more on dramatic features like Mount Erebus and the Aurora Borealis. What element of the, the movie do you find most engaging? How does it help you experience Antarctica? Because that's a big reason that documentaries like this exist. It's to bring, it's to bring nature into people's homes in a sense. And also are there scientific concepts from class that get highlighted in it? So that might be one reason to watch it later in the week, possibly um, after you've seen the climate, uh, the climate lectures. Um, you don't need to watch this over and over. Like I do not really, I don't recommend spending time that you would otherwise spend studying the lecture material on it if you've already seen it. But I will say that um, for especially the, for the short answer questions on the quizzes, there's a good chance I could ask you about the videos or the articles. Um, and speaking of the climate articles that I assigned, they're in a folder called climate articles under, um, under the week two module. And arc article one is about the circumpolar current and it's a bit different from the other two. It's an example of a scientific journal article and it's a good article. It would be a good article to choose for assignment number two, which is in the second half of the quarter after the midterm. 
and it is a bit dense, I will admit. Um, it's also kind of on the longer end of the length that I would recommend for um, assignment number two. Shorter is actually perfectly fine and even better in a lot of cases. And I largely chose it because it heavily relates to the Antarctic circumpolar current, and it gives you a bit of an in-depth look into the studies of when exactly it opened. And the reason that's important is because when the Antarctic circumpolar current opened is when Antarctica became a frozen, uninhabitable desert. So don't worry about detailed notes, but Questions to consider are what, what's the question the authors are trying to answer? What materials did they study or work on to answer this question? And what connections are there between this article and the stuff that we cover in class? And then articles two and three should be a bit more straightforward because they're not primarily, they're not um, academic articles, but they're closer to news articles and they're good examples of articles that you could use for assignment number one. So any questions about all of this before I move into review material? No, um, I do have a question. Yes. Um, the articles, they don't necessarily have to be from the articles that you give us, right? No, in fact, I'd actually, uh, that's a really good point. Um, I'd like you to choose different articles because the idea is that you're writing about something you find interesting. But I'm just giving you examples of what different material you would use for the two different assignments. And the articles that I assign in class are technically fair game for quizzes and um, for the final or for the midterm and final again that's why i include some questions to consider here because this is the kind of stuff that i might ask you about and i also might include i also might talk about one of the articles along with stuff from class in say the intro to a question any other questions Okay, cool. And um, if you, again, also regarding the assignments, you are very welcome to send me um, examples of articles that you're interested in if you want me to green light them and let you know, yes, I think this is a good article. So for lab this week, I have a couple of tips here um, and I'll try to do this each week. You will definitely want to read the presentation the TA has made for you. And that has material that connects it, connects the lab material to stuff you learned in class. And it also pinpoints some of the questions, some of the types of questions that they ask you on the laboratory assignment, as well as sort of what angle they take. And you will also want to review lecture um, 2A about physical geography, because that might help you solidify some terms before you start the lab. So remember, um, one thing to consider is that on a map, a lot of the information is actually there for you. It's in a place called the map legend, which will be a little box with information either in one of the corners or at the bottom. And on a topographic map, it'll have information such as what the contour interval is, what the elevation distance difference is between two contour lines on a particular topographic map, for example. Because on a given map, that is consistent everywhere on the map. To be useful, a topographic map has to have a, have a set contour interval because it's the wideness between two individual contour lines that tells you how steep the terrain is. And also the, the legend will have information like the scale, which tells you how much the distance on the map corresponds to in real life. It basically tells you how to, by what ratio the map has been scaled down. And the cool thing about it is that it's regardless of units. The scale applies to whether you measure out one inch or one centimeter on the map. If the scale is, for example, one to 100,000, that means that one inch on the map that you're looking at will correspond to 100,000 inches in real life, which you can then convert to feet or miles. Likewise, one centimeter on the map will equal 100,000 centimeters in the real world, and that you can convert easily enough to kilometers. And you'll want to look at the edges of the map for latitude and longitude. You'll want to make sure that you look up and down the map, because a lot of the time when a map is covering a relatively small portion of the range of Earth's latitude, you'll have a lot of subdivisions into minutes and seconds. You'll have lines that aren't all, say, 66 degrees, 67 degrees, 68 degrees, but you'll see some that are 66 degrees, and then you'll have a line below it that's just 30 minutes, because remember, degrees of latitude are divided into minutes and seconds, and then it'll go to 67 degrees, and then 30 minutes and then 68 degrees. So sometimes they'll leave off the degrees on the lines in between them. Or you might even have say, starting with 66 degrees, then 15 minutes, then 30 minutes, then 45 minutes, then 67 degrees. The same way on a clock that the 
the minute hand just shows you just shows you the number of minutes. You have to sort of infer whether it's say 66 degrees in 15 minutes, 66 degrees in 30 minutes. Often they'll they'll leave the degrees off because they assume you know that, which is a little bit a little bit like okay, they're assuming everyone knows how to read this, which I guess maybe people going to Antarctica should have trained in this ahead of time. But anyway, for an intro class, that does make it a little bit more difficult. But that's just something to keep in mind, and the TAs also mentioned that in their presentation. So um, questions about the lab before I move on, and I am also always happy to happy with I am always happy to help with lab questions. The TAs should be the first person you ask, especially about specific questions, but I can also help. Like if you come to office hours for lecture stuff, I can I can answer lab questions too. I have a question. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I was trying like not to because I already opened the lab assignment and I was trying to work on it myself and I was trying like not to freak out too much until I go to the TA's office session because I just yeah I've like never even tried to read a map before and I couldn't find the zero point. So I guess my question is, um, will they kind of, you said they have like a, they do a presentation. Does that sort of like walk you through how to do this? Or is it more just like, if you have questions specifically, then they'll answer them. So um, they won't be doing a presentation during the sessions themselves because the number of people who come to those is kind of hit or miss, but there's a set of slides that they made uploaded in the folder that says lab one materials needed. And so that walks you through some of some of it. And then you can come to TAs with specific questions after that. Have you looked at those PDFs? Have you looked at those slides yet? No, I actually, I didn't see that yet. So um, if, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all good. If you go to um, under the module for week two, there's a full, there's um, one, there's one place on Gaucho space that's a link to the assignment itself. And then below that, there's a folder with lab one materials needed. And that um, background presentation is in there. So definitely take a look at that and definitely also come by and talk to the TAs because, because they can walk you through it and help break it down a little bit because it's because there's a lot of information crammed in that map. There's not actually that much that you need to work with, but it maps have a way of creating sensory overload from, in my view um, until you adapt to look at them for the information that you need. And I will say that takes practice. That is something I got better at through doing geology research, but um, I don't think you have done geology field research before. You might have. Um, people I'm very surprised by their background sometimes, but anyhow, does that, does that help a little bit? Yeah, that does. Thank you so much. I'll cool. definitely I'm going to go on Tuesday, and then if I have questions, I'll come to you on Wednesday. Cool. And yeah, that's, that's, that's like I said, that's a great idea. Make sure that you go to the TAs as soon as you can. Um, okay. So let's see, what is this? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> Actually, I forgot to ask any other questions about the lab before I move on to this. That sounds like a no. So, um, okay then. So in regards to what we learned during week one, during lecture two, we mostly went over a number of basic facts about Antarctica such as the fact that it's the highest continent on average, that it's the windiest continent, both in terms of absolute wind speeds recorded as well as on average, how it's the driest continent on average, um, although it's not the, it doesn't have the driest place on earth. The driest place on earth is actually in South America. Um, it's um, another desert, the Atacama Desert. And something I will talk about in this week's lecture is that yes, Antarctica is a desert. It is considered a desert um, and deserts form at the latitudes where it turns out you have dry falling air. But that's me getting ahead of myself a bit. And then we talked about how it's the least populous continent, how it doesn't have anything in the way of an indigenous population. It only has scientists and the crews that are there to support the scientists. So an example question I might give is a bit of a complete the sentence question. Antarctica is the highest continent blank. 
So out of these choices, we have Antarctica is the highest continent on average. Antarctica is the highest continent on average, and the highest point on Earth is in Antarctica. Number C, Antarctica is the highest continent not on average, but the highest point on Earth is in Antarctica. D, Antarctica is the highest continent and would still be so even in the event that all the glaciers were to melt. E, Antarctica is the highest continent because of the Antarctic circumpolar current. And the answer is indeed A, Antarctica is the highest continent on average. And people, most people know that Mount Everest, which is in the Himalaya in Asia is the highest point on earth. And so that, um, that counts out B and C. And also C, you would count that one out because you think, okay, Nicoletta did mention that Antarctica is the highest continent on average because the glaciers overlie everything, which is one reason I put choice D in here because something else I lingered on a bit was that the if the glaciers were to melt, a lot of Antarctica would actually be below sea level because the glaciers actually have enough weight that they have physically pushed the crust that Antarctica is on down into the mantle. And don't worry about the terms crust and mantle just yet. That's something I'll linger on more during the geology unit. And then number E is something that is true about Antarctica, but doesn't really have anything to do with the height of Antarctica. Well, very indirectly it does because there is a glacier in Antarctica and that's why it's so high. And that glacier exists because of the circumpolar current. But anyway, I'll maybe be careful about, maybe I will be careful about my joke answers actually being applicable in some cases, but yes. So um, that's obviously there's other questions I could ask, but that's, that's the sort of quiz or test question you could expect to see from this material. So any questions so far? No. Okay, cool. So then some of the terms that you would want to know from the first couple of lectures are latitude versus longitude. Latitude, lines of latitude being the horizontal lines that tell you how north or south you are relative to the equator, and longitude being the up and down lines that tell you how far east or west you are relative to the prime meridian, both of which you need to determine your location on Earth. Then map projection, which is the particular model you're using to make a map, and then what a polar projection is, a model based at the pole so that there's less distortion at the pole itself. Topographic maps, maps that show elevation and then relevant terms to that, including contour lines, the lines that, the lines that connect points that are all of the same elevation, and then contour intervals, and the contour interval is the set height difference between two contour lines on a given topographic map. And that's going to be established somewhere in the key to the map, which is usually known as the map legend. I mentioned the equator, which is the reference point for latitude. And it's the line of points that are equidistant from the two poles. And when we talk about climate, it becomes important because a different amount of solar radiation, aka sunlight, reaches the equator, then reaches the poles. And that is a big reason why the poles are so much colder than the equator. And that also contributes to why we get atmospheric circulation, because there's differences in the amount of energy being received at the equator versus at the poles. Um, and the prime meridian is a bit more arbitrary, but it was established to create a reference point for, um, for longitude. And longitude, one way to think about it is in terms of time, because time zones change as you go east or west. In the United States, New York, New York is about three hours ahead of the time zone that California is in. If if people study, if people in this class are in Asia, um, they are actually they are I guess actually quite a bit ahead of us in terms of time. I forget that if you go if you go west, you hit the international date line. But as longitude changes, time changes, and that's something that'll come up again in the Antarctic exploration unit when we talk about how longitude was very hard to measure at sea for a long time, which really hampered exploration because it made navigation difficult. And the solution was that was that scientists came up with a way to accurately measure time on ships, which made it easier to determine longitude. And then a few terms relative to Antarctica specifically, the division between East and West Antarctica, separated by the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, which you unfortunately can't really see here. But then there's the Antarctic Peninsula, which is the I guess the most prominent feature sticking out of Antarctica. Peninsula means a feature of what, that's surrounded by water on three sides, but still connected to land. Um, and it um, is the farthest north part of Antarctica. Um, 
part of it is actually north of the Antarctic Circle, and it's thus the warmest part of Antarctica, um, both because it is at a more northern latitude and also is more surrounded by water. And the reason being surrounded by water makes it warmer um, is because water actually helps regulate temperature, which is something I'll talk more about in the climate unit. But then there's the Antarctic Circle, which is the line of latitude below which everything, well, anyway, actually that's the example question, so I'll leave that one. Um, but the Antarctic Convergence, which is another one that I'll leave because it's relevant to this example question. And then the Subantarctic Islands, and I don't need you to memorize all of those, I just sort of need you to understand that those are the islands that are in the Southern Ocean that are associated with Antarctica that are mostly south of the Antarctic Convergence, and then the Southern Ocean itself. So those are actually most of the terms that I introduced that are bolded or underlined somewhere in the text that you could expect to see questions about. And so for the example question, it's another complete the sentence question. The Antarctic, the Antarctic Circle is blank. So A, the Antarctic Circle is a front at which different water masses meet. B, the Antarctic Circle is the line of latitude south of which all of Antarctica is located. C, Antarctic, the Antarctic Circle is the line of latitude south of which everything experiences at least one 24 hour period of total darkness every year. D, the line of longitude east of which everything experiences at least one 24 hour period of total darkness per year. And E, the line south of which the subantarctic islands are located. So what would the answer be here? It yes, it is C. It is indeed C. Because the Antarctic Circle is about darkness. Um, and one thing I mentioned is that it's actually a line that changes time, excuse me, it changes location over geologic time because the tilt of Earth's axis varies over geologic time. Um, and the tilt of Earth's axis is actually what produces the absolute, the total darkness that Antarctica experiences part of the year, as well as the 24 hour sunlight that Antarctica experiences part of the year. Um, and it's not a front at which different water masses meet. Um, the Antarctic Circle doesn't have anything to do with oceanic circulation. That's the Antarctic Convergence. Um, and one thing I mentioned in class is that not all of Antarctica is actually located south of the Antarctic Circle. Um, not to mention that you can rule D out because the different amounts of, well, longitude doesn't really have anything to do with, with sunlight. Longitude tells you how east or west you are, and Antarctica is all sorts of different longitudes. All of the lines of longitude converge at the South Pole. And something that, I guess, one reason that it's a little hard for me to do review on the first couple of lectures, because for the second lecture, some of the concepts get more solidified during the climate unit when you start to learn a bit more about why latitude is relevant. It's relevant to a big extent because different latitudes experience different amounts of sunlight. That's not really anything that longitude has anything to do with. And then as for the subantarctic islands, the Antarctic, that's the Antarctic Circle doesn't tell you about that. The subantarctic islands are the islands south of the convergence. The convergence is really to a big extent what defines Antarctica. The Antarctic Circle just defines, just defines the part of Antarctica that experiences um, total darkness or a period of 24 hour daylight at least once per year. So any questions here? And I'd say that's an example of one of the more, one of the probably more difficult examples of a question I might ask. A lot of the questions might be simpler, like, um, like what is a contour line or true or false, um, two contour lines can cross. Answer would be false in that case because a contour line is defined as an elevation. I have a, a quick question. I just got like a, a wee bit confused about latitude and longitude. Um, if like, I, I think it was like the concept that latitude changes from like east to west, but it's used to represent south and north. Is that correct? Like, is that what's happening? Because I get like... So these, so the lines, they run east to west. The okay. thing with lines of latitude is that, so can you see where my cursor is right now? Yes. 
So as I'm moving along this line of latitude, the amount that I am relative to the prime meridian, which tells me how east or west I am, is changing. However, I'm not going anywhere north or south, outside of the fact that I can't do this perfectly and my cursor is moving a little bit. I'm doing my best to trace this line, and I am staying at the same latitude this whole time. A line of latitude, all of the lines along it have the same number. Excuse me, all the points along it have the same number. So I think this is about, um, let's see, I think this is about, uh, this would be about 60 degrees south. So as I move my cursor, I am staying at 60 degrees south the entire time that I am along this line. Does that make sense? Yes. So the numbers would change as you go like up and down? Yes, the number would change. So my cursor's here. If I were to jump to this line of latitude, then the number would change. That's a separate line of latitude. That's about, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to say 50, that's about 50 degrees south. Okay. So this is 50 degrees south. And then as I move my cursor here, I get closer to the South Pole. So I jump to 60 degrees south and then to 70 degrees south. And then if I were to jump all the way to the South Pole, that's 90 degrees south. Okay, okay, I think I, I get it now. Yep, Very likewise sure. Likewise with lines of longitude. Um, like the other let's way. see, yep, this is the, so this is this is the prime meridian, I believe. If you go the north this way, you'll hit, you'll hit London, which is where they established, okay, the prime meridian will run from the North Pole through London to the South Pole. So that, um, that is zero degrees east or west. Um, and as I move along it, I'm changing difference north or south. I'm going, I'm going from the South Pole, which is 90 degrees south. If I go up here, I'll hit the equator, which is zero degrees. But the entire time, I am still staying at zero degrees west. The distance west or east isn't changing. If okay. I were to change distance east or west, I would have to jump to this next line of longitude, which would be, um, say, I think this is 10 degrees east, 10 degrees east of the prime meridian. So as I move along this line, the longitude isn't changing at all. The latitude is because I'm shifting direction north or south, but I'm not shifting direction east or west at all. Does that help a little bit? Yes, I believe so. I think I need to just like stare at it for a little while. Not a problem. Again, I have like never tried to read a map before in my entire life. Well, good luck to you with it. It's always hard the first time, but that's what the TAs and I are here to help with. Um, and then, yeah, actually a good, if it's, you can also think about it, it's the same way you can think about a, a graph with an X and Y axis. Um, um, but whatever, whatever works for you. Other questions that, here? In that example, oh. would like latitude be X? Yes, the latitude would be like the horizontal or x-axis mm -hmm. and the longitude would be the y-axis. Cool, and the last slide I have in here is a little bit about the human geography, which is mostly about the bases. So you definitely want to know where the three United States bases are. Um, McMurdo, which is the largest base, is here in the, around the Ross Sea in East Antarctica. Um, and then you have Amundsen Scott Base, which is at the geographic South Pole. Um, and then finally, you have Palmer Station, which is in the peninsula. And it's the smallest station and largely serves as a resupply point for the United States resource vessels. And I did also at talk about a couple of other countries' bases briefly. You have Halley Station, which is the cool one built on stilts that they built that way to reduce the amount of contact with the ice. Um, and that's also become hard to, man hard to keep people in during the winter because it's built on one of these ice shelves, the extensions of the glaciers out over the ocean, which have long been thought to be more stable, but because of climate change, they're breaking up. Um, we learned a bit about Scott Base, which is McMurdo's next door neighbor. It's the little New Zealand base right next door. Um, and then about the abandoned Pole of Inaccessibility Station. Uh, the Pole of Inaccessibility is not the South Pole, but it's the point, it's somewhere in here. It's not marked on here because it's an abandoned station, but it's the farthest point in Antarctica from any ocean, which makes it extremely cold. Um, and then, th so that was built by the Soviet Union um, years ago. Um, the successor state to the Soviet Union, the current Russian Federation has a station at Lake Vostok, which is um, it's built above a subglacial lake, 
um, one of the lakes that exists under the ice due to the pressure from the overlying ice. And Lake Vostok is where the coldest temperature on Earth was recorded. And in general, Vostok Station is a cold, windy, dark, and overall sort of miserable place to be. Um, other things to consider are points I made about the overall population levels in Antarctica at different points in the year and what types of people live there. So a slightly easier question this time, true or false, the human population of Antarctica is much larger in the winter than in the summer. So is that one true or false? Are there more people in Antarctica in the winter or in the summer? Summer. So false, right? No. Yes, false. Precisely. Yeah. Okay. Precisely. Sorry. I, sorry. I thought you said fall, and I was like, uh, I didn't hear any. Sorry. The, the connection got garbled. But yes, more people are in Antarctica in the summer because um, it is very difficult to get to or leave Antarctica in the winter, and a very small number of people actually stay there all winter. So that's what I have for the review presentation today. Do people have any questions before I shut the recording off? Okay then, so thanks for coming by. Some of the future sessions might be a bit longer because I'll have more material to cover. Um, um, <laughs> that is a good point. I am talking about winter in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and yes, that's something I could make sure to be more specific about, but, but if we're talking about Antarctica, we're talking about the Southern Hemisphere. Because whether you're dealing with winter or summer is really dependent on where you are in the world. And if you're in Antarctica, yes, yes, it's winter in the northern hemisphere when it's summer where you are, but it's summer where you are if you're in Antarctica. So that's what you care about. So yes. Okay, cool. Other questions before I turn the recording off? All right, thank you all for coming. I'll be uploading this in a bit and I'll be around for office hours until four today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.